Bam. Good evening. This is Rob Bell, and you're watching Getting the Record Straight. Um, welcome. Good evening. Um, please, when you see this, take time to subscribe, share, and like, and most importantly right now, stay safe. Uh, with me this evening is a very special guest, brother I've known for quite some time, but haven't seen or talked to in, in quite some time. So uh, I'm really uh, happy that uh, Glenn Ellis is with me. Uh, Glenn is, uh, I guess, a pioneer of sorts to me uh, in terms of <laughs> health and nutrition. And, uh, you know, I was kind of going over in my mind uh, how long it's been and when I uh, uh, kind of first encountered Glenn. And uh, I kind of remember him back, you know, doing the uh, uh, nutrition and uh, supplements and stuff on 40th Street. But, um, Welcome, Glenn. Good evening. Thanks for coming. Hey, my by. brother. How you doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, boy. I, listen, I go, I go way back, man. Yeah, you know. man. University of Penn and all that. Yeah, man. I, and man, I, you know, I, I just want to say, first of all, thanks for having me. And it's really a, 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 not just an honor, but it's a privilege to be here with you on your program. <laughs> and I mean that because um, mm -hmm. you're a pioneer in your own right, my brother, because you just, <laughs> you know, Look up one day you wrote you're an author you writing books and then next you know <laughs> I've tried so, a few things man well, you know? I think, but you know Rob I think that um one of the things I want to say you say you couldn't remember the last time we saw each other but the more important thing is that we're fortunate that we all connected at a point where we created lifetime relationships yeah absolutely. that weren't conditional on frequency or mm -hmm. depth or how, you know, or whatever, what you do for me or what you do for, I do for you. It was just some genuine stuff. And it was just a, a real, I believe that was the ancestors speaking, you know, that brought us all together and connected all, cause we were from everywhere. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. and then the next thing you know, there was this commonality. Mm -hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? So I just, I feel, I feel that man. And so I'm just grateful to be here, man. And we still here to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. That's the important thing, man. And I had uh, really a shock last week and lost someone uh, really close to me. And uh, you know, you can't you can't overstate just how important it is to 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 still be here and really just tell people how much you care about them when you can, you know, because you never know. But um, but let's go back a bit and and kind of tell us. Um, like I said, I, I kind of reflected. I can remember. You know, going into a, a store, I, I, it was it yours or what? Yeah. You know, tell us how you yeah. got there because I, I was, you know, reading your your bio and you were a pre med major, right at Penn? Yeah, man, it was all I was all over the place. So <laughs> let me, you know, because um, you know, I, I, a mentor of mine, Daisaku Ikeda, mm -hmm. said that if somebody asks you what do you do for a living. <laughs> If you could just say, if you could answer them in one word, you haven't really fulfilled the potential that your life has. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I say that just as a foundation. So just to get to where you trying to start at the herb store, the path that led there came from out of Alabama, right? Mm -hmm. Which is where I grew up in Birmingham. Right. Okay. So I, I grew up in the 60s in Birmingham. I, my, I lived in the neighborhood where that was the epicenter of the civil rights movement. You know, um, my friends, classmates were the four little girls who got killed in the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing. Uh, in fact, I just talked to, uh, there was a fifth Terrorism. girl, the fifth girl lived. Mm -hmm. So I just talked to her last night. She Her book, somebody just published a book, Africa World Press, called The Fifth Little Girl. Because she lived, she didn't die, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. so we still we remain friends. So anyway, that pathway. So I went, grew up in Birmingham in that era. Seg total segregation, schools, water fountains, back of the bus. All of that was a part of my reality. It wasn't like I was reading in books or watching it on the news. This is how I lived. Mm -hmm. So after finishing high school, where I finished, uh, you know, all black high school, obviously. My high school principal was Colin Powell's father-in-law. Colin Powell married Alma Powell, mm -hmm. who was Alma Johnson, who was mm -hmm. my principal's daughter. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, 
but it was just that kind of history just steeped in. Mm-hmm. I was just all around all kinds of stuff, man. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, when during the Vietnam War, Colin Powell was a lieutenant in Vietnam at the time. And when he came home for on leave, he would come to Birmingham to visit his little girlfriend, right? <laughs> and her father was an education guy. He was trying to like go to college kind of guy. Yeah. He he was an army guy, so that he was not good enough for this man. So he was constantly trying to prove, you know. So <laughs> occasionally, Rob, we'd be in the uh, in high school, and um, and there'd be an announcement over the PA system. So all boys, please go to the uh, auditorium for a lecture from Lieutenant Powell. All the boys to the auditorium. Lieutenant Powell will lecture. We mm. like, oh man. <laughs> 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 no, you in high school, you ain't trying to hear that. No, no. And well, so, uh, and he, I'll, I'll never forget, he said, the future for colored boys is the army. <laughs> you could get learn a trade and get a skill. You can get a GI loan. You could go to school and blah, blah, blah. You talk, you know, what that was year was this, roughly? Can you? Oh, this was 1968. Eight sixty nine. I finished high school in 71. Oh, in 71. Huh? Right. So I was about yeah. like in the ninth, 10th grade, right around that time when that would, when I had that experience. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I left Birmingham and came to Philly and went to Penn. Mm-hmm. Now, that ain't all it sounds like. I was not a dumb guy by no means. I was at near the, all, I was finishing a class of 600 kids. I was in the top 20, I think, or whatever. So I went, mm-hmm. but I knew I wasn't, once I got there, I realized I was not, no, I, I wasn't prepared for to go and compete academically at the Ivy League, right? Mm-hmm. Those are all prep school kids and, you know, mm-hmm. Shipley and Choate and yeah, all of that. Yeah, academy, where are Yeah, we? yeah, that kind of stuff. And I came out of the public school, the segregated mm-hmm. public school system in Birmingham, Alabama. Sure. And had no business realistically being thrust into that. <laughs> but it was a quote time of quotas. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in this early 70s where federal money had to be tied to that you have to reach quotas. Mm-hmm. So Penn was just doing what they could to get quotas. So mm-hmm. we call, now we look back and a lot of us that were there say it was like the Roach Motel. Mm-hmm. You check in, but you don't check out. Because mm-hmm. most black people who went to Penn during that time didn't finish Penn. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They didn't walk out of there with no degree. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But that's a whole yeah. other story. So all of that brought me to Philly. Now, in high school, as a kid, I was always a biology science kind of guy. Mm. I, I was fascinated by that. You know, mm. I'd be out in the plants and mm-hmm. catching frogs and, mm-hmm. you know, look doing stuff. I don't even want to talk about some of the stuff I did to some <laughs> frogs. But anyway. <laughs> hey. Hey Rob, Rob, just pull my coat if I'm going off too much. It's all right. Huh? Just, no, just do your thing, you gotta, man. You know. I told do you, you I'm, I'm going where you take me now. If you let me, <laughs> if you play, you gonna let me drive for a while. Then you gotta go where I'm going. All right, go ahead, man. But anyway, um, so by the time I got to high school, I was in the Future Scientists of America and blah 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 blah. So I had a proclivity for science. Mm-hmm. What you know, I ain't no genius, but I had a proclivity for that. Mm-hmm. So that means pre med was an automatic pathway. Mm-hmm. So I came to Penn as a pre med student, but by the time I was getting ready to look at going into medical school, I realized the business of medicine was not something I thought I was going to be like a black Marcus Welby type dude, you know what I'm saying? Come by the crib, everybody, all right get my little bag, little boy got a headache, you know. I thought I was into that kind of healing. I was a heal. I, I was thinking about it as a healing. But I saw that there were things like, and there was a brother who was named uh, Rocky Andrews, Dr. Waverly Andrews, who he became. Mm-hmm. And Rocky was about three or four years ahead of me at Penn. So he was already in medical school doing his residency or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so he they looked out for the younger ones of us who were coming up behind them on that path, Mm -hmm. just like the engineering blacks did, just like the pre-law people. So everybody tried to look out for each other Mm -hmm. because that's who we are. So Rocky told me one day about him having to pull the plug on a patient that he was taking care of. You know, it made me realize that this is like, 
they got people's life in their hands. And if, mm -hmm. you know, if it ain't, it ain't showing no results, they can like, no, we ain't putting no more money into this. <laughs> so that made me change my path, my direction. Mm -hmm. Medicine was not what I was interested in becoming mm -hmm. a doctor. I then, as fate would have it, at that very time in my life, that same summer, a friend of mine. 75, 76? This was 75. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine had uh, was going with this girl whose uncle was real tight with Dick Gregory, mm. and and I met that guy one day, and so through my buddy Wayne Jordan, as a matter of fact. Oh yeah, okay. Dash I Jordan, remember Wayne. Dash, yeah, yeah. This guy's name was Mercil Randolph. So one day, out of the blue, Rand Mercil Randolph calls me. And he said, hey, Ellis, uh, listen, I, somebody need to, uh, I want you to meet somebody, you know, tonight about seven. And I said, he said, I can't tell you no more than that. And I was like, what? So I ain't thinking, I thought it was a girl, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because when I went over there with dad, Wayne, I, mm -hmm. I was with, he was going to see his girlfriend and I was there and I met the uncle and he said, I wasn't with nobody. I said, oh, I'm trying to hook a brother up. <laughs> 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 so, at the time, he was a manager for one site, some site at for PHA, the Pro, uh, Philadelphia Housing Authority, in, at Haddington Homes. He no, said, meet no. me at my office, come to my office at six or seven or whatever time it was. I get there, it's him and Dick Gregory. <laughs> Dick Gregory, long story short, told me, say, man, listen, I, I just, I've been trying to find somebody. I need somebody to work with me. Mm -hmm. I'm working on this, trying to develop, I'm developing a product. Mm -hmm. They pulled out this little bag of herbs, they mm -hmm. showed, gave it to me. It was, I'll never forget what was almost like a, 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 a Ziploc bag mm -hmm. with a label on it that said Dick Gregory's 4X formula. You mm -hmm. see, I'm trying to turn this into a product that could be like a shake and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. He said, you got the background to understand how to help me do some leg work for running around, basically. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm in school. I'm just, you know, I got to, he said, well, this ain't gonna bother that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it was the last semester I was in school anyway. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that turned into me working with Dick Gregory, like literally working with him to do, develop the Bahamian diet. Oh, uh, right, okay. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. We, I was with him all, I mean, all through that. And what's interesting is a lot of people don't realize um, there were a couple of things that Dick was a masterful man. I tell you, man, I got pictures of him right now. He and I, um, and he talks to me all the time, but, um, he told me, called me one day and say, hey, man, I need you to find me a fat man. I said, what? Mm -hmm. He said, I need a fat, find me the fattest brother you can find in the country. <laughs> so me and this brother named Reggie Turan, who also worked with Dick, he was Dick's a, a, a real a, a executive assistant. He traveled with Dick more, mm -hmm. much more than I did. Mm -hmm. And so me and Reggie was, Reggie found this boy up in New York named Walter Hudson, weighed a, weighed a thousand pounds. Jesus. So Dick got him on the Bahamian diet and had the news bands and the mm -hmm. international press. So he could, you know, but anyway, so that I worked with Dick Gregory, and I was all of, all those years up until he died, literally, because I was at, at his bedside in D.C. when he died. I wasn't there literally when he died, but you know, within 24 hours or so. Mm -hmm. But um, so I was—he's definitely a major part of my life, man, and mm -hmm. who I am, and and the courage and all that. But that that gave Dick gave me the pathway to really understand the holistic industry. Yeah which also helped me to reconnect with what I knew from growing up in Alabama from my grandmother. Mm -hmm. I can tell you many a day I was sent outside to go get some of those things around that tree. Uh -huh. Right. The next thing I know I'm drinking this iced tea. That's like <laughs> delicious. But then that night I had a bowel movement that I ain't had in two weeks. <laughs> so they, so I'm just saying these people, I, I, so I had some of that kind of understanding from my ancestry. And then I just got more into it. And I'm traveling all over the country with Dick and we go into all of these health food conventions and I'm meeting the people from Bragg's apple cider vinegar, mm -hmm. the actual person, you know, Dr. Mm -hmm. Patricia Bragg and this person and 
you know, Linus Pauling. And so he's connecting me with all these people and I'm getting more and more acclimated and I'm still in my academic mind anyway. So I started continuing my studies. So I studied herbal medicine, literally studied it formally in Los Angeles. Then I studied five for five years. I spent studying classical homeopathic medicine. So I'm a classically trained homeopathic physician as well as a classically trained herbalist. So that means I don't just like, you know, everything is very specific. So it's not the way you just off the shelf, go get some of this or that. So it's really like a doc, you know, I used to have a pra an active practice, but uh, my other activities just became so overwhelming. I didn't have enough time to properly devote to that. So now it's just a very, not a hit or miss, but if, you know, yeah. If Rob called me and said, "Hey man, can you hook a brother up?" Then I'm gonna be there for Rob. But I don't. I'm. Not, it's not an active part of my life. But so that led to what Dick did the Bahamian diet. He opened the company. They made a gazillion dollars. Then ran into some problems that were internal, and uh, I've had moved on. And you know, and I also got went on another fork in the road and started at the same. Around that time, I was also getting into film and video production. Right. Mm -hmm. So Ken, Ken Dosser, Chet Taylor, and myself formed a production company called Human Interest Production. Mm -hmm. And we got a pilot done through a program at the time, at, uh, it was Capital Cities Communication, which was then the parent company of Channel 6 in Philly. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. So they granted us some little community production money. We got one of those awards and went and produced this 30 minute docu, I mean, a little television show for young people and it won an award, a national award in New York and everything, right? So, boom, we had Stevie in it. And that's when I met Stevie. That was in 1978, right? So okay. Stevie and I have been friends all since then. So I got Stevie to be in it. Dick Gregory was in it. Terry Collier performed. Mm -hmm. Who else? I mean, it was really a really nice piece. But anyway, then that led to the next thing I know, I did some HBO and Showtime and Cinemax specials for, I did, uh, Teddy Pendergrass, come back to come back. I was a part of that production. I did Patti LaBelle's concert, live concert, at Gro some Grover Washington, Pieces of a Dream, Stevie Wonder. You know, so I was really in that role. But then I got married. I had some little kids and I was, you know, I'm, I'm going to be with my kids. So I'm thinking that I was silly enough, but smart enough at the same time to think that I could actually be based in Philly and make it work. Just any that kind of it, it, at the time that was so far ahead of his time that I I didn't so that made me really get back into the health food part of my mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. right so that was around the early eighties I think so well, let's, let's segue to now you had again going back to uh, what I read I saw you went to school in Liverpool yes tell me about that and and experiences because you've done a lot of lecturing and that kind of thing overseas and in other countries. Yeah. So, you know, what's sorry, going man, on I, in other I countries? I thought I was in third. I thought I was on my therapist's couch, man. I was about to, you know, I was going down the road with you. <laughs> but yeah, so all, you know, out of coming out of the health food thing, I, I started to be getting requests from people to write. Hey, mm -hmm. could you write an article about what, everybody's talking about this echinacea thing. What is it? Can you write mm -hmm. something for my newspaper? Mm -hmm. So I started, that got me to writing. Mm -hmm. And then that increased to now what is now a nationally syndicated weekly column in the black press around the country every week. I've been writing for 15 years or something like, I don't know. Okay. But okay. Mm -hmm. so, um, and it also got me pulled more into the actual formal medical world, being asked to come there to do talks. Mm -hmm. and then that got me involved with being on the board at some medical institutions that approve the clinical research that like this vaccine that I hope we get a chance to talk about mm -hmm. uh, the vaccine. But um, so then I started to realize, I don't like, you know, in that play Hamilton, the dude said, I want to be in the room where it happens. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to just be in the room standing in the corner holding refreshments. I want to be there in the room where it happens. I want to have my voice in the room. So it made me understand coming out of Alabama, I am at the heart of my very being. I'm a activist, mm. social justice mm. and equity. 
Right. So now what I'm realizing that I was now moving in a place where I said, okay, you got to inform yourself so that you could effectively be in this arena and do your activism. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that made me realize I went to did graduate work in healthcare hospital ethics at St. Joe's. Then I went to university of Liverpool. I did in, um, and did a um, master's in public health with a focus in global health as well as epidemiology. Then I um, became a fellow at Harvard Medical School in bioethics. Mm -hmm. Then I'm, now I'm a visiting scholar in bioethics at Tuskegee uh, University's uh, National Bioethics Center. And now I'm back at, at Harvard at the same time they asked me back again. Oh. I'm, I'm a fellow, I'm teaching up there again. What do, now, what do we mean, or what do you mean when you say that topic, uh, that some bioethics? Man, listen. Well, a lot of people try, will, will focus on explaining that by looking at what happened at, with the syphilis study at Tuskegee, mm -hmm. right? It was an unethical study. Absolutely. Sure. Right? You got men with syphilis. You're making them think you're treating it, but what you're really doing is just seeing what happens if you don't treat it and let it go its full course until they kill them. Mm -hmm. And you just dock it. So that was an unethical treat. So bio is relating to life or the body or, you know, mm -hmm. and the ethics is what are the ethics around our bodies and our health, right? Is it ethical, for example, for us in the Philadelphia area, in the middle of a global pandemic that one of the, in the richest country in the world, in one of the major cities of that richest country, that the black community can't even get testing. That black doctors COVID-19 consortium who are really doctors themselves who got full-time jobs, who have to moonlight to go to church parking lots to test black folks. Mm -hmm. that is an unethical, that's an ethical violation, right? Or for somebody to be in a research and don't realize they're in a research study that what they're taking may not help them. So there are a lot of aspects, but this is an area, it's a very new field, 20, 30 years, so, so to speak, maybe 40 years, but it's a critical issue and it's an area that's becoming more and more important. Mm -hmm. Who determines, what's the ethics around when the ICUs get, you know, you see it every day and say, well, we're running out of space. We're not going to have ICU rooms and for the beds coming with the surge. You see that in the news. So the question is, who decides who gets the room? Well, I mean, it, it, it's, it would seem to be particularly problematic in a country where your medical system is profit driven. Like this one, <laughs> exactly. which by the way, this is the only healthcare system in the entire developed world mm -hmm. that is tied to the free market. Mm -hmm. Not in Germany, not in, in, in UK, not in France, not in Spain, not in Canada. And you've been to these places. And Absolutely. And, and I studied, their, that's what I do. I study healthcare systems, you know, I'd have been all over, you know, pretty much all over the world, I, you know, close enough that I don't need, to, if I don't ever go nowhere else, I'll be fine. Right. So the notion that it's too expensive and can't be done in this country is. We got the most expensive healthcare system in the world. And we got some of the poorest outcomes in the world. We don't have nothing to show for our money. Nothing. I'm wondering though, too, um, on the research side, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned, and I, I, I hope I'm not by myself in this, in this regard, but, uh, you know, something I've been thinking about a lot over the past few years is, you know how they talk about everything being weaponized and militarized and that there's this co-mingling of 
military and research and bio weaponry and that kind of thing. And I, I'm concerned about how much do we really know that's going on in terms of, um, you know, uh, uh, bio warfare and that kind of thing. And what's, you know, what's really going on with that. And, you know, with these viruses that seem to just have come about over the past, you know, couple of decades and that kind of thing. I'm just wondering well, let me how, how much about, oversight is being, you know, provided. Well, I mean, it depends on who's watching, <laughs> you know, who, you know, we, we know we ain't watching it. Right. Right. You don't know, ain't nobody on your, in your contact list on your phone that you could call and say, yo, man, give me the real deal. What's going on with this thing? Mm -hmm. We ain't none of us in no position to know what really is. Mm -hmm. And that really goes for white and black people and brown yeah. and everybody else. Don't nobody know. So that's why we have to remember what sustained our ancestors for 400 years in this, in this country, common sense. Mm -hmm. You know, if I had, I wish I had a penny for every time somebody asked me, was I going to take the vaccine? Are you going to take it, man? What you think? Are you going to take it? Mm -hmm. And I told them, no. And I, but I also make sure people understand why I say no, because I'm not an anti-vaxxer. You know what I mean? I'm not against anti-vaccines on the, on the note. No, 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 no. I know, I know, like I said, I'm a science guy. I know what's going on and understand that. What I do know, I mentioned I was on those institutional review boards that approve clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Just like this stuff that's going on now that is considered a clinical trial. So they, it had to be approved to mm -hmm. go on into research. Mm -hmm. A typical vaccine takes an average of three to five years to develop if everything goes right. So of course, common sense for me says, well, what did they, what could they cut out to do this all in less than six months? Mm -hmm. So that I'm still wait. I don't have any answers to that question. Mm -hmm. So I'm a, I think that all of our decisions should be informed decisions. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to just not get the vaccine. I'm saying I don't have enough information right now to make a decision. Here's the second point. It take, it's a two dose vaccine, right? Moderna's and That's Pfizer. Heard, yeah. So let's add on to that question about the six months time. How much time would they did they have to say, okay, Rob, we got this vaccine. We're gonna test it out on you. We're <laughs> gonna give you a shot. And then how much time did they have to watch what happened before they give you a second shot. Mm -hmm. And then how much time are they spending to watch what happens with having gotten two shots to draw some data to give us a conclusion? Six months ain't enough time to do all that. Now, I ain't the smartest guy in the classroom, but I do know that much. And that's why I'm asking to and waiting to see when they release the data, because everything we know about it is what they are releasing through a press release. Ain't no papers and other data been really released for us to analyze, at least for me to analyze. Mm -hmm. So that's where I am with it, with the whole thing. Have you looked at what um, has been going on in some of the, in some of the other countries? Because haven't some other countries developed or created anything? Uh, no, 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 no. Russia, Russia is at the same. Russia has said they done they've done the same thing that mm -hmm. Pfizer has done. That they got something called they call it a Sputnik or something like that. I forgot. But um, here's the, let me let me go back to uh, something else you you meant, raised uh, a second ago that I wanted to address. You talked about all these viruses that's just coming out of nowhere, right? So here's what happens. First of all, we have to understand more about viruses. For almost for every one per human being on this planet, and there's seven billion human mm. being. For every one, there's at least a billion viruses. Bacteria, germs, all that stuff. Mm. This is their planet. We on it. <laughs> We're just here. <laughs> it, on our skin right now, there's thousands of different bacteria all over that protect us. Mm -hmm. There's bacteria in our, in, in our intestinal tract. You know, the friendly bacteria and the bad bacteria. 
That's so good. you got to keep the right balance of that or else your, your stomach will be all jacked up. Mm -hmm. So viruses are everywhere. Now here's where we come in. You know, they, they know scientifically now there's enough evidence that if you take a child, like for example, the children that grew up in Mississippi, you know, grew up barefooted and playing in the, out in the dirt and running around and wiping their hands and their mouth with, you know, not washing their hands before they eat. They, the data shows they're the, they have, they're the healthiest teenagers and adults because they expose their immune systems to things that help them be able to fight it off stuff that they encounter as teenagers and adults. Mm -hmm. What we are doing, think about what we're doing is making ourselves more vulnerable to what's already out there. We sterilize everything, not, not I'm talking about before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Everything is like, wipe it down. You know, everything is a, a antibacterial soap, antibacterial dishwashing. So we, our environment, we we've disrupted the natural kind of order of things, and so now we've now made ourselves more susceptible to things that were already in the universe. I mean, on the planet, so to speak. Yeah. If, I don't know if that's getting too deep or not, but no, uh, no, I feel you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but do you think though that the kind of machinations of government, the military, I mean, you know, when when you let's go back to what it, when you were talking about uh, Colin Powell and the Vietnam War and what have you, you know, we were dropping napalm and. Uh, what is it, Agent Orange and those kind yeah. of things. Yeah. And like I said, you know, there are things that international organizations have banned and said that, you know, where they were uh, criminal type things, but, you know, were they ever really stopped? You know, have we ever, uh, I don't even think we're part of the, um, what is that treaty that bans uh, uh, chemical weapons and that kind of thing? Uh, like the Geneva Treaty or the UN one, one of those Treaty, treaties, yeah. but you know, every now and then I'll come across something that talks about, um, you know, experiments and, and things of that nature that uh, uh, um, speak to issues around biology, med you know, uh, medical issues and that kind of thing. And it seems like it's always a tie in with the military. And, and, you know, how can we weaponize something? Have, I've even seen things, in fact, you, you know, you talk about uh, um, uh, the brother who, who basically uh, tutored you. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, Dick Gregory yeah. once he, talked he, about- He tutored me all right. <laughs> but who talked about, you know, um, you know, the military dealing with the environment and, and weather and that kind of thing. But all of that's but see, all of that's not speculation. That's all fact. And it's yeah. now, you know, it's, you know, we're now at a point now where we're beyond the fifty year period where a lot of that stuff is now public information now. You know, mm -hmm. with classified files that, you know, they have to after fifty years let anything that's still in there. The only thing they haven't let out is John F. Kennedy's files, right? <laughs> about the but no, about the assassination. Sure, sure. You know, because um if you believe Lee Harvey Oswald killed that boy, then I got a bridge to sell you. Yeah, yeah. You know, and see Dick, Dick, you know, I'm so indebted to him, man, because and just so grateful that I, for whatever reason, I had the life that I could end up that close to that man, that for that many years, and um, he enlightened me to some, a whole bunch of stuff, man. He got, he got, you know, there's a book he wrote called uh, Code Name Zorro. Mm -hmm probably hard to find, but it's a documented book that he co-wrote with this guy, Mark Lane, who's a lawyer in DC. I, I've heard it. Mark Lane did a lot of stuff yeah. on the uh, King assassination. Exactly. So he and Dick wrote this code name Zorro book that talks about the assassination of Martin Luther King and shows right. how the yeah. FBI did, you know, that was all, you mm. know, but I'm just saying, so all of this, we have to understand, you got to look at Patrice Lumumba. You got to look at all of the cold-blooded assassinations. They've overthrown country. So that's why, and you know, to his credit, that's why Trump laugh at him when they be coming at him about stuff. He'd be like, do y'all know what we do to people? 
and y'all gonna sit here and hold have a double standard? Mm -hmm. We started off, we done slaughtered millions of Native Americans sure. and took everything. Ain't nobody got a dime for nothing. Then we brought a few million black folks over here from Africa and made them build the whole country and then give them nothing. And you think I care because y'all say I'm talking rough? That's who we are. We, you know, so I'm just saying that to say there's nothing shocking or unbelievable about what, what's possible with those kinds of things. Because if it's just impossible for it not to be true. Yeah, I just I just wonder how much when you talk about ethics, how much of some of this stuff, you know, is being done by man himself. You know what I mean? As opposed to, uh, well, you know, I, I, yeah, and natural, I, natural kind of. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Development. Well, see, more mostly, I'm thinking about there are a lot. Of, the ethics I'm looking at are are really public health ethics. Mm -hmm. You know, just the ethics of making almost 60% of black people in this country live in places where they're toxic in environmental racism, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, 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 and the, you know, the ethics of ain't nobody made sure. Is it ethical that a school breakfast program for little children that the, that is the only way they eat breakfast and during the pandemic, that ain't a priority. To make sure that somebody's that there's a system in place that they continue to get breakfast. Yeah. While well, we talking about keeping the restaurants open and sub, you know, which I'm okay with, because you know I like some of them too. Mm. But I'm just saying, at the expense of ignoring those kind of things, who's making sure that old people who used to take the CC and see what did I accept the thing to get, you know, to go to the shopping and picking right. up groceries. Who's making sure that the elderly in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania's got one of the oldest populations, a second only to Florida? Really? Yeah. So, and in black, our community ain't nothing but old black people. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying, we got to understand what the ethics are about that sort of thing, right? And, and are those, I mean, there's so many things. And what many of us who, and the few of us who are black, who happen to be black and who are bioethicists are realizing that white bioethicists kind of hijack the field of, bio they're trying to hijack it and make, when you hear the word bioethics, it's about something like gene editing or that kind of, you know, artificial intelligence, which are important and they do have some ethical concerns that need to be addressed. But they turn it away from what we now understand are social determinants of health. Studies have now shown that eight, between 80 and 90% of how healthy you're going to be is going to be determined not by nothing that happens in no doctor's office. It's going to be determined by the social determinants, where you live, the condition of your housing, the environment you live in, the safety of the place you live in, your educational level, your income level, all of those are going to be more important because you could go to the doctor and the doctor check you out and say, Glenn, you got high blood pressure and here, blah, blah, blah. You need to take some exercise, you know, take a walk every day around the block, mm -hmm. eat, some, eat fresh vegetables, cut out the fried foods. Then I go home right to the heart of the hood and I got, I got my options on a three piece and a biscuit, <laughs> right? Or some sweet and sour Chinese food from the takeout place. Mm. right? Sodium and, and, and fried foods. Mm. My neighborhood too dangerous. I can't go walk. So mm. that's why I'm saying social determinants are more important in determining your outcome. But all the money is in the healthcare system. And none of the money is out to make sure those things are addressing those aspects of our health. Mm. Right? So that's why I mean that they're, the, high, the field is being hijacked to tie into where the money is, not to where the right thing to do is. What do you think in terms of strategies vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, black African-American communities, local communities, city of Philadelphia, you know, city of Baltimore, Washington, D.C., where you have, Philadelphia, you have 
I think it's 10 black city council people who could pass, you know, they have the majority to, to pass or certainly impact and influence what's needed. You know, what so, kinds of strategies should we be looking at well, in terms of public health, you know, locally? Well, well, this goes back to the core of what I told you I am. I'm an activist. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, who's well educated, well trained as a bi bioethicist, well published, you mm -hmm. know, well traveled, well lectures, you know, all the academic affiliations from Tuskegee to Harvard and Penn and everything else. But I'm an activist. Mm -hmm. And when I was 18 years old, and I went home on spring break from Philly to go to Birmingham. And I went downtown to the post office and got the little card to fill out for voter registration. And my, and I was at home at my folks house writing out the card and my grandfather came by and just stopped by the house for something. I'm, you know, just a regular visit. And he said, well, hey, how you doing, son? Good to see you. I said, hey, grandpa, what's happening? Blah, blah, blah. He said, what you doing? I said, I'm filling out my voter registration card, grandpa. He said, that's a good thing. I said, hey, Grandpa, well, by the way, are we Democrats or are we Republicans? He said, no, ain't no we. That's You have to decide what you want to be. Mm -hmm. He said, but I can tell you this. You got to really think carefully because Martin Luther King is a Republican. Mm -hmm. And George Wallace, the governor, is a Democrat. Mm -hmm. So be careful that you understand what they mean. So I was like, mm -hmm. wow, that's deep. <laughs> you know, that was deep, you know. And then he said, he said, you've known a lot of people personally in our family and our friends and neighbors around the city who got killed and hurt, beat up and put in jail fighting for the right to vote. I said, yes, sir. He said, I want you to remember all that they got, they took all that punishment so that we could have the right to vote. Mm -hmm. Always remember that your votes are like having bullets to put in your gun. Mm -hmm. People fought for you to have the right to have bullets, mm -hmm. not the right to have to shoot your bullet when they say there's something to shoot at. Mm -hmm. You decide when to use your bullets. So that was the other deep thing he said that was mm -hmm. real deep, mm -hmm. right? Um, but then he said, focus on your local, where you live, the local area you live in. Anything above that is white folks' business. Mm -hmm. Make sure you got full accountability by the people that are local. And see what we have done is made the mistake of allowing everybody local to get all of us to follow their finger pointing when they say, look up there, at, look up there at DC. We got to get him out of there. Mm -hmm. So we, they call it, look way past. Mm -hmm. Rob, Rob, we got, we have, we're the fourth most segregated city in America right now. We got the, highest rate of poverty of any major city in America. We got one of the highest rates, I mean the lowest rates of college graduates of any major city in America. We got the highest rate of college dropouts. We got the high, we got a homicide rate right now in the black communities, particularly that is over 45% higher than it was last year this time. It's almost ha doubled in, in the middle of a pandemic. And we had everybody making us pay our attention to Washington and to Harrisburg when our, it, I, where our problems and the things that affect us are right here. And I'm going to say this, man, and a lot of people that may not like it, and that, that only means nothing to me because I speak truth to power. <laughs> Walter Wallace was murdered in front of his mama by the police, right? Mm -hmm. Who His mama who called and asked for help because of a mental health issue. He was shot 14 times. The coroner says the first bullet hit him and he was incapacitated after the first bullet, but yet he was shot 13 more times. Within the time he died and the day of the election, Barack Obama, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, and her husband came to Philadelphia specifically to help get the black vote out. 
not one of them mentioned that mm -hmm. incident about Walter Wallace. Right. The thing that was most important to black people at that time. So we don't have any accountability for those to whom we bestow the power. Because mm -hmm. I don't blame nobody that's in office for nothing they do or don't do. I blame us for making it, us not making it clear what they have to do. Right. So that's where they, that's the strategy. When are we going to have the courage to demand, a, to, to hold people accountable? Well, um, look, man, it's really been great for you being here. Uh, what about, you got any closing thoughts on, uh, you know, the health of the black community? Uh, yes. I think that at the end of the day, one of the things Dick Gregory used to repeatedly say, remind us is the most three most important things for our health are free. They don't cost nothing. Water, air, and exercise. Mm -hmm. Just don't lose sight of those. We have to keep our bodies hydrated. Dehydration is the most prevalent condition in America. And if you don't believe it, think about everything that typically you buy over the counter mm -hmm. at a drugstore are products for dehydration. Whether it's a dandruff shampoo, a headache pill, a laxative, something for diarrhea, some kind of oint medicated ointment for your psoriasis or your eczema, mm -hmm. Ben Gay or something, or Tiger Bomb for your knee, uh, arthritis knees. All of those are signs of, uh, of dehydration. We got uh, 60,000 miles of blood vessels that go through our bodies, 60,000, enough to go around the earth three or four times if you could tie them in a string. Mm. And the blood has to circulate through all of that. So what are we doing to support a healthy circulation system by making sure we are as physically active as possible. Mm -hmm. And there are people say, I got a bad back, a bad knee, bad neck, and I got that. Whether it's true or not, I tell people, all you got to do, when you're sitting there watching the game, mm -hmm. when you're watching them soap operas, or who wants to be a millionaire, or Real Housewives, of West Philly, or whatever you're doing, when the commercial come on, stand up in the chair, and just walk in place <laughs> while the commercial, just walk yeah. for them two minutes. And when the commercial go off, sit back down. But every time a commercial come on, so there are things we can do. There's no excuse for us not doing the basic stuff. There's a whole lot of stuff for us that we don't have no control over, Rob. Mm -hmm. But there's enough stuff that we do. All right. On that note, again, man, thanks so much. For coming through. Uh, this has been I'm getting ready. the record straight. And uh, we're going to talk some more. Uh, Anytime, we'll be, man. I wish we won't be a stranger like this. No, sir. And hey, Rob, keep up, keep this up, man. And I just want you to know how proud I am, man. And uh, I hope you uh, reach for the stars, my brother, because this is going to be a long ride for you. Just keep, stay focused here. Doing the best I can. All right, man. All right. Okay. Take care. Thanks again.